You see, I took Hashem, King of the Universe, blessed be He, very seriously. I took the study of His Torah very seriously. So naturally, I took violations of His holy law and blasphemy very seriously. Unfortunately, I also took myself very seriously. And with Him, that doesn't usually play too well. There are many scriptures that I thought were written in support of me. The holy prophet Isaiah wrote, In Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Now when it says the people, it does not mean the Gentiles themselves. It means the people of the Holy One who live among the Gentiles in Galilee. And when it says who live in darkness, it does not mean that there are so many clouds that the sun does not shine. It means rather that they are in the spiritual darkness of having departed from His holiness. And when it says, have seen a great light, what is that light but the heat and fire of His judgment upon them? As it says later in the same chapter that they are, destined for burning, and they will be fuel for the fire. By the grace of the Holy Lord, who is a forever blessed, I was called to be that judgment, to bring that light and fire to those in Galilee who blasphemed, who thought their crucified criminal leader equal to the one. But the holy prophet Amos wrote of the coming judgment, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord, for that day will be darkness, not light. Or both, Brother Amos, or both. For when I read the words of that great warrior, David, your word, your word is a lamp for my feet. It is a light for my path. I thought I was on the side of King David and that God was on our side. The old king knew better than that, and I should have too. A light for my feet, a lamp to my path. When the light appeared to me, Father David, it was so bright, so piercing that I couldn't see the path anymore or my feet. I was literally blinded for days. When this light shone, I thought I heard a voice or a presence with an aha as it searched me out and discovered me. Painful, harsh, blinding light. Who or what are you, sir? I dared to ask. I am Jesus, came the dreadful reply, whom you persecute, he said. The very blaspheming Galilean who caused all the trouble. I hated him and his people for their ungodly ways. By heaven, my anger burned with a heat and a light. For so I thought. I was burned with heat and light. But my anger was as nothing now faced with this light. What I thought was a holy, righteous anger seemed little more than irritation, like the annoyance of being poked in the ribs when you're sitting comfortably. And there was a smile in that blessed voice, now as he said to me gently, but irritatingly, it's hard for you when you kick against the goad, the cattle prod. And all my proud ideas, my career plans, my self-image, came crashing down like a great big rickety house built on sand. And everything went dark. I could not see. My darkness brought on by light. But what did I know of light before this? What did I know of righteous anger? What of holiness or justice or love? Nothing. The greatest, the highest, most noble achievement I had managed this far was to be irritated. To feel the Holy One, blessed be He, poking me in the ribs with His cattle goad, His irritant, Jesus. And instead of going where He wanted, I'd kicked out. Silly, educated, self-righteous, ineffectual man. Blind guides, that's what He called us Pharisees, this Jesus who made the blind to see. Won't they both fall into a pit? My colleagues had to lead me by the hand to our accommodation in Damascus. Straight street, straight as the way was, I still blindly bumbled into things. It's hard for you to kick against the prodding. Jesus was an irritant. Deliberately, God's irritant, pushing me into the right way. Peter once told me a story about when he got it wrong. 
Jesus told him about the cross, and Peter tried to talk him out of it. You're too special and precious to die, Peter had said. Jesus got angry. Peter said it reminded him of a weird episode the week before. Jesus healed a blind man, except like Peter, like me. He could see, but not clearly enough. Men looking like trees. The man needed more healing, more Jesus. You can have ears to hear, but not hear, Jesus used to say. You can have eyes to see and still not see. But Jesus traveled to where people were to heal them. He sought me out to blind me. Seek me out now and heal me, Jesus. How had I missed the son's resemblance of the father? When our first parents sinned back in the garden, God did not stand apart and judge, but came back. He walked up and down in the garden asking awkward questions. Where are you? And in our day, he did that again, walking up and down among us, asking, where are you? How did I miss it for so long? He came looking for us, calling us. That's Jesus. He walks straight up to you, and he spits in your eyes. And then, then your eyes are opened, and you see for the very first time. Blessed be he. King of the universe, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the prince of peace, of whose governance there will be no end. If you have ever been to an operating room, the most striking thing about the room is the brightness of the lights illuminating every corner of the space. The brighter the light, the better the surgeon can see to operate. I mean, think about it. Ever get a Splinter in your finger, what's the first thing you need? (laughs) A bright light. Ever lose a button or a coin, what's the first thing you do? Well, you get a flashlight, and you try to shine that light into the corners and the crevices all around the room, wherever you might have dropped that particular item, so you can see to retrieve it. The brighter, the better. Let me ask you, how many of you wear reading glasses? I'm sure many of you, like me, put it off as long as you could, right? (laughs) Well, I tried to ignore the fact that my eyes were aging. Well, my whole body's aging, but that's another story. But as time went on, the words on the page kept getting murkier and blurrier until the page looked like just a scramble of gray forms on a napkin. But in the absence of reading glasses, well, the more light that you shine on the page the easier it is to see, to pick out the outlines of those letters. So let's just say it. Light makes things clearer. Light also reveals things that you never knew were there. Don't believe it? Well, just shine the brightest light you can on that table that you haven't dusted for a while, or on that box in the corner over there that you thought was squeaky clean. (laughs) Light reveals Every smudge, every fingerprint, every spot that you couldn't see until you shined the light directly on it. Light makes clear not only what you want to see, but also what you may not want to see or what you didn't even realize was lurking there. Light reveals. Light manifests. Light bears all of the blemishes. But light can also burn. Anyone like me who stayed out in the sun just a bit too long knows that this is true. And it matters what kind of light you stand under or lie under if you're trying to get a tan. In fact, the harnessing of a single wavelength of light and focusing that wavelength in a single direction creates what we know as a laser. And laser light can either hurt or heal. And so if I shine my flashlight at the floor or at the carpet or at the wall or even at you, I'll see better. If I, however, turn this flashlight toward me and shine it into my own eyes, (laughs) it'll hurt a lot. And I won't see anything but that light. And when I take the light away, I'll see black spots for a long time. In fact, if I stare at that light too long, my eyes will be damaged just as much as 
if I stare at the sun too long. Light is a powerful energy source, and it can be blinding, and it can take you by surprise. It certainly took Paul or, or Saul by surprise that day as he rode with his men toward Damascus to round up those renegade Christians. You see, there was a synagogue in Damascus filled with some of those people who had been identified as worshiping Jesus. The man that the Roman authorities had executed and, well, whom some claimed to be raised from the dead. Saul's job was to bring them kicking and screaming back to Jerusalem, where they could be tried and most likely stoned for heresy and blasphemy. Paul had a simple worldview. There were the Jews and then there were the Christians. And the Christians had to go. That's just how he saw it. Until that day when he encountered the light the light that would ultimately help him see. When Saul encountered the light that day, it wasn't just any light, not an eclipse of the sun, not a torn retina, not a panic attack, not a migraine, not the sun at high noon. Saul was blinded entirely by the presence and the glory of Jesus, then cast into darkness for three days and three nights. And from this darkness of fear and confusion, he would emerge a new person. No longer Saul, the persecutor of Christians, but Paul, a new creature in Christ, Jesus' greatest missionary. You see, Jesus, the light, had come into Saul's life and had revealed his true heart as well as his many sins, not the least being a coat rack for executioners of Jesus' own disciples. And Jesus, the light of God's presence, had come into Saul's heart and had killed the sin that had been overwhelming Saul and restored the soul that would be Paul, born into Christ. The light had come into the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The light of salvation had won. From out of darkness is born light, the manifestation of God. From out of fear and shame is born resurrection life. And from out of blindness is born new vision, new eyes, new hope, a brand new person. Ever get your picture taken and the camera flash practically blinds you? It's ready, flash, <laughs> and you're left with all these black spots in front of your eyes. But, but without exposure to that blinding light, and then time in the dark room, a photograph cannot emerge. Of course, no one thinks about that process anymore in our digital age. We just press the button, and voila, there, the picture's all done. But if you're a true photographer, a professional, you understand the process behind the photo. So when a photo is taken, first, a negative is produced. But before its colors can be revealed, that negative must first be processed. The negative is what we might say light sensitive. It's not used to the light, not ready for the light. It must first be plunged into the darkness and into a solution that will help to develop it. And then kept for a while in the darkness, the photo develops silver halides upon it. I learned that in science class. After the process is complete, the silver salts or scales are then washed away and as the photo dries, the true image is revealed. In a sense, this is what Paul went through those days. In a blinding flash, Saul's instantaneous confrontation by the living and powerful light of Jesus blinds him to his past life. And for three days and nights, he's plunged into a dark room, the same darkness that Jonah must have felt as he languished in the belly of the fish. But when he emerged to be baptized and mentored, he became a new creation. His sins were washed away along with his former ways of seeing, and new eyes had emerged. No longer was he Saul, persecutor of Christians, but the image revealed in Paul became the image of Christ. For I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives 
in me. Just as God's promise to us is revealed in the multicolors of the refracted light that we call a rainbow, we too are broken so that we may become Christ in living color and see the world in a whole new light. May God grant that to you, for Jesus' sake. Amen.